Our scripture today is from John 16, verses 1 through 14. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because the people do not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can uh, now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. May God bless the reading of his word. We have been looking at the first part of the Apostles' Creed on the last two Sundays. And when we recite the Apostles' Creed, we make our declaration of our faith. These are the fundamental pillars of our Christian faith. Last two Sundays, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And today, we look at the phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit makes up the Holy Trinity. The word Trinity is not mentioned in the Holy Scriptures. However, it is consistently seen throughout the Bible. For a message today, I want to answer two questions. Number one, who is the Holy Spirit? Number two, why did the Holy Spirit come, or what did the Holy Spirit come to do in our lives? So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a force, he is not a vague shadow, nor is he an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is equal in every way with the Father and the Son. All the divine attributes are possessed by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say about the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 16. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Dr. Irwin Orr, the world's foremost author on revival, described the Holy Spirit as the commander-in-chief of the army of Christ. He goes on to say that the Holy Spirit is the Lord of the harvest, supreme in revival and evangelism and missionary endeavor. Without his consent, says Dr. Orr, plans are bound to fail. The presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, my friend, is very vital. In fact, the presence or the absence in a person's life makes a difference between life and death spiritually. Now let us look at the second question. Why did the Holy Spirit come? The Holy Spirit came 
to bear witness of the Lord Jesus and to lift up the name of Jesus and to glorify him. As Jesus came to exalt the Father, the Holy Spirit was sent to exalt and glorify and lift up the Lord Jesus. Therefore, it's logical that the more we allow the Holy Spirit to control our lives, the more we will love and serve our Savior. And the more we will be conscious of his loving and abiding presence in our lives. <clears throat> now, I want to share several things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives and in the world. Number one, John 16, 8. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins and our sinful lifestyle. When we do something wrong, it is the Holy Spirit who nudges us, sometimes very easily, sometimes more forcefully, telling us that we are not in the right. He uses our reason, he uses our, our circumstances and our conscience and our hunger for God. So the Holy Spirit brings us to the point of yielding our lives to Jesus Christ. Secondly, the Holy Spirit cleanses our heart from sin. You see, the Holy Spirit indwells in our lives as Christians. When we accept Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit enters, to, enters into our hearts. But there must be a time in our Christian walk when we totally yield our lives and our wills to the Holy Spirit. We must allow him to be Lord of our life. And then the Holy Spirit is our comforter, our encourager, our counselor, our helper, our friend. All these terms are appropriate, coming from John chapter 14, verse 16. And I read it to you from the New King, New King James Version. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. I like that. He'll give us another helper. That he may abide with you forever. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. Now there's a challenge. I will talk to the Father, and he will provide you another friend. I like that term too. So that you will always have someone with you. In other words, the Holy Spirit is going to be a friend that will never leave us. He's going to be with us. And this friend is the spirit of truth, John tells us. The godless world cannot talk, take him in because it does not have eyes to see him doesn't know what to look for. But you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. He will be in you. Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit who lives in the heart of every believer. The word comforter means someone who sympathizes, someone who feels our hurts and our anxieties. But this word means more than that. Perhaps the best translation would be the encourager. The Holy Spirit is our encourager and always helps us in the time of need. Jesus told his disciples that the Father would send another comforter. The word another here means another of the same kind. You see, the Holy Spirit came to do for us what Jesus did for his disciples when he was walking on earth. We've already said that the Holy Spirit is equal to the Son and able to encourage us, as, just as Jesus encouraged his disciples, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And he is to us what Jesus was to his disciples. And there are several ways... I'm still on one topic here. There are several ways the Holy Spirit encourages us and helps us and counsels us. 
He teaches us the truth of the Holy Word. He is our teacher. He is our helper, helper to understand the Holy Scriptures. Jesus gave his disciples directions concerning his will, and the Holy Spirit leads us into God's will. Paul says in Romans 8, 26, the Holy Spirit prays for us and helps us to pray in God's will. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groanings. Thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, the Holy Spirit who lives within us prays for us constantly. He's always praying for us. And that should be a great encouragement for all of us. The Holy Spirit also brings spiritual healing. He binds us up when we are broken. And he soothes us when we are troubled. And relieves us when we are in pain. We are never without hope, my friend. The Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is working in us. The Holy Spirit is also the one who leads us into God's will. We all want to live in God's will, do we not? As the Lord Jesus had led and inspired his disciples while on earth, the Holy Spirit comes to do the very same thing for all of us. We're not left as orphans. Paul said, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Sad is the day when we don't think we have weaknesses. We as Christians seldom admit that we don't know how we should pray, but my friend, the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit has come to bring boldness to go beyond ourselves. He brings boldness to go beyond ourselves. The Holy Spirit has come to inspire and equip ordinary people like us to work for the Lord Jesus. Many years ago, in England, a Methodist leader and college president, Samuel Chadwick, wrote this, and I quote, The work of God is not by might of men or by the power of men, but by the Spirit. It is by Him the truth convicts, converts, sanctifies, and saves. The philosophies of men fall. But the Word of God in the demonstration of the Spirit prevails. End of quote. Our Lord, our Savior, our Lord, the Lord Jesus, is seated at the Father's right hand in heaven today. But He has sent the promised Holy Spirit so that through His power we can fulfill God's will and we can defeat every device of Satan. And we can extend the kingdom of God here on earth. No matter what difficulties confront us as believers today, God is calling us to receive this great promise of power as a living reality. Then in victory, we can praise God alongside those believers down through the ages who have experienced for themselves the truth of greater is He that is in you than he that's in the world. Did you hear that? Greater is He that's in you than he that's in the world. And also the Holy Spirit empowers us to become a witness about Jesus Christ. The Lord made a profound statement to his disciples as they stood on Mount Olives outside the city of Jerusalem. Acts 1.8, Jesus told his disciples, but you will receive power 
When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And because of that, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's our mission. That's our challenge, my friends. We are to be witnesses. The great commission of evangelism is the great work of the church, and it can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. What followed after the ascension is that the disciples returned to Jerusalem and began an extended prayer meeting. And that was the setting of the beginning of the church. They patiently waited. I'd use that word patiently. Waited. Before God for the power to come upon them and lift them above themselves. Peter would no longer be Peter the failure. He would be Peter the mighty preacher. He would be transformed, not by learning something new from the Scriptures, but by experiencing a new dimension of God's Holy Spirit in his life. <clears throat> it was the reality of God supernaturally empowering him, this servant to accomplish his assigned task. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon admitted, Without the Holy Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without wind or chariots without horses. Like branches without sap, we are withered. Like coals without fire, we are useless. When Jesus' disciples thought back to those memorable days on Mount Olives, I believe the words kept ringing in their ears, we will receive power. We will be his witnesses. We will receive power. We will be his witnesses. You see, their Lord had promised to supernaturally equip them to establish his kingdom in Judea and in Jerusalem and around the entire world. And the Holy Spirit provides for us an abundant and fruitful Christian life. John 10.10 10 said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. The Bible promises that every Christian can possess love and joy and peace and faith and many other beneficial qualities. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And Paul says against all these things, there is no law. So why is the average Christian not experiencing this great quality of life? Dr. Billy Graham some time ago said this, according to his research, at least 90% of Christians in America are, not, are living defeated lives. That's astounding. 90% of Christians in America are living defeated lives. So where does the power come from? The very simple answer is this. It's the filling of God's Holy Spirit living in our lives. Through the century, many followers of Christ were just ordinary Christians. Nothing spectacular had ever happened to them or through them. And then, as, the, as, as happened to the Apostle Peter and the other disciples, they were filled with the Spirit, and their lives was changed, and their lives were changed forever. They were no longer average. 
They became men and women of God, instruments with power. Their defeat turned into victory. Doubts and fears turn into assurance and joy and faith. They're the ones who the writer said in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, they turn the world what? Upside down. That's powerful. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, they turn the world upside down. Cowardly P- Peter, for example, who denied Jesus three times, became the bold Peter of Pentecost, who preached fearlessly. On separate occasions, 3,000 and 5,000 people believed in Christ and were added to the church as a result of Peter's preaching. The early disciples possessed a, a strange new quality of life, a life of power that transformed their hearts of, of the, in, in the wicked Roman Empire. The change in their lives began at Pentecost, when those who had gathered together were filled with the Holy Spirit. And through that same power of the Holy Spirit, millions of others, down through the centuries, have been transformed into vital, dynamic Christians. As we close this morning, I would ask you, Two or three questions. Do you long for this kind of power in your life? Do you really long daily for power? Do you long for boldness in your witness for Jesus? Do you long for this kind of victory in your life? Let me share with you in a closing how you can be filled with the Spirit of living God. Number one, we need to realize that we are commanded by the Lord Jesus to be filled with the Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to evil and wickedness. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Do you think that God would ask you to do something beyond what you were able to experience? Absolutely not. We need to realize that we are powerless for service without God's Holy Spirit. We need to have a hunger to be filled with the Spirit. In John's Gospel 7, 37-39, Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty this morning for more of God? Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, doesn't stop there. There's a comma. They shall be filled. For us to be filled with the Spirit, we must completely, completely surrender to the Lordship of Christ. We must invite the Holy Spirit, who already lives within us, to take total control as we yield to his lordship. I'd like for us to bow our heads and I'm going to pray a prayer and I'm going to ask you to repeat it after me if you would. As we seek the filling of God's Holy Spirit this morning in this service. Father, thank you this morning for loving us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood that cleanses our heart from all sin. Thank you for sending 
the Holy Spirit to live within us. I realize this morning I lack power to be all you want me to be. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I may be the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you for your promise in your holy word. And I thank you this morning that you have heard my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen.